Today, 2,500 acres and growing. Fire crews are battling a new brush fire tonight. People told to evacuate. We're on fire watch. Plus, a tip to police leads to a deadly confrontation. The latest on the investigation. Also, he's been missing for days. Now, police say a teenager who disappeared in Joshua Tree may have been a victim of foul play. Also, it can do more than smooth your wrinkles. Hear about a new use for Botox. Good evening, everyone. I'm David Jackson. And I'm Pat Harvey. It's 8 o'clock, and you're watching KCAL 9 News. You're watching KCAL 9 News at 8. What started as a small brush fire in Acton has now grown to 2,500 acres. Tonight, mandatory evacuations are in effect. The fire has already destroyed a bridge, a mobile home, and an abandoned structure up there. This began just before 1.30 this afternoon in and around Acton. That is northeast of the Foothill Fire in Santa Clarita. We have live team coverage tonight. We're going to begin with Larry Welk overhead, though, in Sky 9. What do you see, Larry? David, I wish I had good news for you. We're looking at uh, flames right now toward the Angeles National Forest. That's actually uh, Angeles Forest Highway that uh, these flames are burning against. Let's show you a wider picture right now. It started as a very small fire near Acton and very quickly grew to this 4,500-acre fire. And uh, as I said, uh, there are several homes that were in the path of this fire. In fact, uh, there's another ranch home right there, and there's a fire just about uh, 150 yards away from the property line on that home. Let me show you another ranch-style home here, uh, how quickly this fire moved through. You can see the right side of your screen. There is black all around that home right there, that little ranch-style property there, and that is because the fire ripped right through there. Firefighters got into a defensive posture. They went in there, and they protected those homes. So a couple of outbuildings have gone, but for the most part, this fire just continues to race its way eastbound, sort of paralleling the 14 freeway, the smoke visible from a very wide area. As the sun is starting to set right now, we still see some very gusty winds in these canyons, and you can see the fire showing no signs of letting up. Now, there's a major power line uh, section that moves through here, and uh, Edison is warning that some customers may have uh, power failure, but at this point, we haven't heard any reports of that. But the fire continues to make its march here. Again, I wish I had good news, but it continues to make its burn up these hills in the wild uh, Angeles National Forest here. And firefighters, for the most part this afternoon, protecting structures and letting the fire burn around those structures. When it moves up here a little further, they'll be able to take a stand and try and knock it down. Hopefully, they'll get a little help from Mother Nature. But right now, this fire totally out of control. That's the latest from overhead. I'm Larry Welkin, Sky 9. Back to you. Hey, Larry, we know that uh, the firefighters are, are stretched. These fires have been burning for uh, actually from, from the weekend, and here we have a new fire that has popped up. Um, wondering if it's too late for aerial assaults right now, or are they trying to attack this uh, from the air as well? Well, they still have aerial firefighters uh, that are out here right now, helicopters, airplane. In fact, we just saw the last uh, tanker come through here and drop some FOS check. And again, as the sun sets, they will be headed back to base for the night. They are still out here. But, Pat, I have to tell you, we've seen a lot of these fires over the last few days. And at this point, these uh, aerial assets really aren't going to help a fire like the one you're looking at right now. They pretty much have to let it burn and take a stand somewhere up the road a little bit uh, at, a, uh, at a, a fire road, perhaps, or uh, use those dozers to cut a line because uh, there's just no putting this one out. All right, Larry. Thank you very much. We'll get back to you during the course of the hour. And, of course, we'll see you again later on in the uh, later hours of Prime 9 News. That's right, but we do have more coverage for you right now. In fact, from a different perspective, KCAL 9 Sandra Mitchell is on the ground in Acton with more. Sandra? And Pat and David, in fact, we were right on top of those flames just a few moments ago when we witnessed an incredible firefight to save those homes in the Aliso Canyon area. If you take a look just behind us there over the hillside now, you see those orange and black huge plumes of smoke. That's where the fire is really ripping through the hillsides right now. We want to show you some video of just how close this got. 25 foot flames, that's what we're talking about, ripping up the hillside. You can almost see that house there in the background, the Aliso Canyon area. About 100 families forced out mandatory evacuation as it raced through the Acton area. This is a very rural area, but there are about 100 homes and ranches in the area. Many of those people that were evacuated just drove just a few miles away to see what was going on. You see the firefighters there trying to save their homes, planes dropping that fire retardant and uh, water. On the ground, those hotshot crews positioned themselves out
outside the homes. And we did just get an update now. We are told that one mobile home, one outbuilding, as Larry told you, and then one large structure. And they say it might have been a home that burned that large structure. Structure. Sharon Corbett was ordered out of her home. Her husband and son stayed behind to help the firefighters. And then she watched what she thought was her house burn. Nervous, very nervous. I just, don't, I just don't know. I mean, I don't care about the house. It's just if they could just get off the mountain. That's all I care about. Hold on. What's it look like to you from here? Well, doesn't black smoke mean a structure has gone up generally? So I don't know if that is the, the one behind us. But I would imagine if that is a structure, they're probably going to get them off the mountain. And uh, as we take a look from uh, Sky 9 there, you can see that incredibly long fire line continuing to burn right now. A lot of animals in this area. In fact, there was an animal shelter that had to get 1,000 animals out quickly. The structure wasn't in any immediate danger, but fire crews really want these areas, the neighborhoods, these narrow winding roads through the canyons cleared out. So if they have to move their fire apparatus in quickly, they are free to maneuver and get in an offensive position there to fight this fire. I talked to one fire captain earlier this afternoon. He said the message to the people who live in these foothills areas of uh, Acton tonight is pack up now, get everything loaded up, get ready to get out. This is a dangerous fire. It's going to continue to burn throughout the night, and if you live in the foothills, Hill area, you need to be ready to get out very quickly if the fire crews come through and tell you it's a mandatory evacuation. So again, if you're in the foothills of the Acton area tonight, be prepared to get out. Mandatory evacuations in the Aliso Canyon area, some other areas of Acton right now, but everybody really needs to pay attention to what's going on out here right now. We're live in Acton tonight. I'm Sandra Mitchell, KCAL 9 News. All right, Sandra, we'll get back to you too. Some refugees or evacuees from a fire near Santa Clarita are being allowed to return to their homes tonight. The fire that scorched more than 6,000 acres is now moving away from homes. One resident of Placerita Canyon never evacuated his home, even though the fire roared right up to his property. I decided I'm 70 years old. Where am I going to go? You know, my, my wife always said she's going to have me cremated. I figure maybe I'll save a couple bucks. Well, this is what the fire looked like at its height. Flames that threatened 1,600 homes. It is 65% contained tonight. Now residents are worried about mudslides when the rainy season comes later in the year. Well, we have uh, Josh Rubenstein in right now, and he's going to give us an update on the weather conditions. More on the dry conditions. Yeah. High winds, high temperatures, and low humidity that's been fueling these fires. Is that how it feels out there, Josh? Sure is. Uh, take a look outside the shot from Sky 9 right now. An extensive fire line near Acton, uh, just uh, below the Antelope Valley. And what we are seeing, we're still seeing some breezy conditions out there. It was gusty throughout the afternoon, gusts upwards of 20, 25 miles an hour. Now we're starting to see things relax a little bit, and hopefully the fire can lay down as it usually does at night. But as you can see, very difficult terrain out there, very steep and a lot of vegetation to burn. Uh, let's take a look at the numbers. Uh, right now near the area where we can see the winds and the temperature actually as well. Uh, winds are right now out of the southwest. Take a look at uh, the new computer. Bring it on up and you'll see what I have going on here. Winds out of the southwest, 7 miles an hour. These are sustained winds, but we are seeing some gusts upwards of 12 to 15 miles an hour. Here's Acton. This is the 14 freeway coming off of Santa Clarita towards the Antelope Valley right here. As you can see, the winds right now pushing the fire up towards the north and towards the east. So that is going to be a concern because as you get closer to the Antelope Valley, you start getting into a more populated region, even right around this bend going into Palmdale. I don't know if you've ever driven that. Uh, you get a lot of new developments popping up here, so that certainly is going to be a concern over the next uh, several hours. 86 degrees right now in Santa Clarita, so still warm at this hour as well. Little bit of relief for firefighters coming up, and I'll tell you about that in just a little bit. We'll give you a five-day forecast as well. Back to you guys. Right, Josh, thanks. What a big scare at seven Orange County government offices after they received letters containing a white powder. Several hundred workers had to be evacuated. A hazmat team determined the powder sent to the DA and sheriff's offices is not anthrax. Tests are still being done on letters received at the halls of administration, the probation department, the state building, a federal building, and Santa Ana's City Hall. Officials say the letters are very anti-law enforcement and they think all of them are connected. State lawmakers tonight say they are close to agreeing on a key issue that's been holding up the state budget. Lawmakers on both sides have been at odds over a state labor law that restricts school districts from contracting with private bus companies. Union bus drivers rallied at the Capitol today saying private bus contracts threaten their jobs. 
Democratic and Republican leaders say they're close to a deal that would let districts outsource while still protecting union workers. The deal could finalize a budget plan by the end of the week. It'll be a compromise, obviously. Uh, we don't get everything we, get, uh, we want, but uh, uh, certainly the other side doesn't either. Uh, we think we protect the workers that are the bus drivers, but we also allow some contracting out under certain circumstances. The state controller has said the state must have a budget by a week from tomorrow before it stops paying its bills. Well, a young child is attacked and is clinging to life tonight. We are live with the latest information. Plus, the search intensifies for a Southern California teen who disappeared while hiking in Joshua Tree. Why investigators believe he was a victim of foul play. Also, a Filipino truck driver held hostage in Iraq is a free man tonight. Is pop singer Michael Jackson going to be a father again? And Ruby the Elephant is packing her trunk and heading back to the L.A. Zoo. And a live look from Acton, where a brush fire is burning out of control. We're back in a moment. On the next nine on the ten. Dive into the action with Southern California's most extreme photographer, Joe Jennings. I don't think what he does is crazy. Joe is absolutely nuts. See why this clothing store has become the hottest place to shop in Beverly Hills. This is Hello Kitty gone glamorous. Plus, meet the co-winners of the largest Super Lotto Plus jackpot ever. The buys you a big dream. Nine on the town. Tomorrow at 6.30 on KCAL 9. And once again, these are live pictures up above Acton. We have Sky 9 up above, and we have crews on the ground. We'll be bringing you updates on the fire as it continues to burn up there throughout the course of this hour of our news. Pat. All right, David, it's huge. Well, police shot and killed a man during a traffic stop in El Monte. Investigators are trying to determine if the man is connected to the shooting death of a six-year-old girl over the weekend. KCAL 9's Joel Conable is live in El Monte with the latest in this developing investigation. Joel? Pat, this morning when police got this call, this suspicious car driving around with a possible gun inside and two suspects, they thought the two suspects may be connected to the shooting death of Bryesha Lindbrook. She's the first grader and six-year-old girl who was shot and killed Sunday night while walking home from a 7-Eleven here in El Monte with her father. But as of now, police say there is no connection to that case. One suspect, the driver of the car, has been released from El Monte police custody and the passenger, as you said, was shot and killed by an El Monte police officer. Let me take you back to what happened at a 11 o'clock this morning, the intersection of Valley and Garvey here in El Monte. That red Acura, two suspects inside. Detectives told that they were possibly driving around with a semi-automatic weapon. They pulled over the car. They asked the driver to get out. Police say the driver complied, got out, put his hands over his head, listened to police. But police say when they walked up to the passenger side, the passenger in the car did not comply. And tonight, we've also spoken to family members who say they are related to the man who was shot today. They say he would never have been carrying a gun in a car. That passenger was not cooperative at, at, at all. Uh, he wasn't complying with the detective's orders. Uh, the detectives saw him, or which appeared that he was reaching under his seat, um, fearing that he was reaching for some type of weapon, possibly the assault rifle that was in the previous uh, information. Uh, they fired several rounds, striking the passenger one time to the upper torso. One of my neighbors came and told me that my brother was dead. So I came up here to see and I couldn't come in. So I talked to one of the, to one of the officers and he was telling me, he told me to, um, I have to go to the police station and talk to detectives. And I went, just came from the police station and they didn't tell me nothing. That man you just heard from the brother, Joseph Vieira, tells us it was his brother in the car. His brother's name is David Vieira, 23 years old. That family was brought here to the El Monte Police Department to talk to detectives. We have not seen them since. We've also been told that when this police stop was made, there was a man with a video camera, a person who works as a freelance video journalist who was at the intersection, filmed the actual police stop, filmed the police shooting. But for some reason, detectives confiscated his videotape, the videotape taken by L.A. County homicides detective and not returned. Of course, that videotape will uh, give a lot more answers as to what happened this afternoon, but police telling us the detective felt his life was in danger and felt he had good reason to shoot. We're live in El Monte tonight. I'm Joel Conable, KCAL 9 News. All right, thanks for that, Joel. And we've been following that fire uh, in Acton where when we last checked with Larry Welk, firefighters were having a very hard time of it. 
and they chose to fight it by actually letting this fire burn. Larry is still up above, as you can see from uh, that shot, looking down in the Acton area. And a lot of these flames, of course, coming close to structures and right along the roadway. Uh, Larry, you told us about 16 minutes ago the fire not certainly getting any better. In fact, maybe getting worse. We assume that's still the case. It absolutely is getting worse uh, in terms of acreage. It continues to grow at this hour. Now, the winds have subsided. The sun has finally set here. Temperatures cooling off a little bit. But look at this fire line right here. That was Angeles Forest Highway that you were looking at uh, with firefighters there on the road trying to slow the fire's pace. Look at this ranch home right here. Flames approaching the property line there, and there are firefighters there trying to protect the homes. Earlier, we saw several other homes in the area where the fire roared right through the homes and actually uh, burned right around the homes and continued to burn. That was their strategy. They wanted to protect the people and the homes here, and that's exactly what they did. So right now, as the fire grows, the good news is that the firefighters were able to protect those homes, and now they've got a real battle on their hands uh, tonight and for the next couple of days, certainly. Reporting live overhead, I'm Larry Welk and Sky 9. Back to you. All right, Larry, we'll get back to you in a little while. A Filipino truck driver is celebrating his freedom tonight after terrorists freed him in Iraq. Angelo de la Cruz was let go earlier today after almost two weeks in captivity. Yesterday, the Philippines withdrew its final peacekeepers from Iraq and demanded, as demanded by de la Cruz's kidnappers in Iraq, he is thankful that they did not carry out threats to execute him. I would like to thank you to the people of Al Mujahideen for a good treatment for me. So I only say, Thank you very, very much. Well, later, Dela Cruz enjoyed a meal with Philippine embassy staff. When he returns home, he will receive gifts, including a new house and scholarships for his eight children in the Philippines. It's a nice ending, though. Mm, he, he, it is. That's for sure. Yeah. Oh, he's glad to be out of there. Sure is. Well, L.A. County launches an aggressive attack against the West Nile virus. Plus tonight, remembering one small step and one giant leap for mankind, 35 years later, it is an historic anniversary in space travel. And why singer Linda Ronstadt was kicked out of a popular Las Vegas hotel. Well, concern still growing as the West Nile virus is spreading. Today, mosquito abatement teams began spraying the L.A. Arboretum as L.A. Mayor Hahn announced more steps to stop the sometimes deadly virus. KCAL 9's Angela Chi reports. If West Nile virus infected mosquitoes have been found in or near your neighborhood, you will see warning signs like this one posted at your local park or recreation center. It's important to be aware of the potential dangers that are posed by West Nile virus. Today, Mayor Jim Hahn and county health officials addressed the spread of this mosquito-borne disease. To date, seven human cases of the West Nile virus have been reported and confirmed in L.A. County. While no one in the city has contracted the virus, they have found two virus-infected dead birds and several infected mosquito pools. There's four other uh, places in L.A. City uh, near Atwater Village, uh, around Griffith Park, uh, where West Nile virus has been confirmed. This morning at the L.A. County Arboretum, where infected mosquitoes have also been found, mosquito and vector control workers sprayed the pesticide Scourge to stop the virus's spread to humans. There is a concert this Saturday at 7.30, uh, right at the time when mosquitoes become active, and we feel that uh, there is sufficient risk to the public so that we are doing this. Health officials say those most susceptible to the disease are people over the age of 50. While it can be deadly, only 1% of those infected have severe symptoms like disorientation or convulsions, and most don't show any symptoms at all. About one in five have mild flu-like symptoms, a fever, a fatigue, a weakness, uh, but many people with West Nile don't know it. Vector Control says they are doing everything they can to protect the community, but since 80% of all mosquito breeding happens in private homes, people also need to take their own precautions. In Echo Park, Angela Chi, KCAL 9 News. The year was 1969, a year after a King and a Kennedy were assassinated, and a month before Woodstock. Mankind was about to take a giant leap. The United States sent and landed a lunar module on the moon. July 20th, 1969. And soon after the eagle landed with the nation and the world watching, Neil Armstrong gingerly descended the steps and placed the first human foot on a foreign world. 
That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. 35 years ago, Buzz Aldrin would join Armstrong on the lunar surface as Michael Collins circled above in the Apollo 11 command module. And how much of a technological miracle was this moon mission? Remember, this was 1969. They were still building Corvair cars, and a computer was the size of a house. That's for and sure. most of our, our young people, I mean, MTV, I, I'm mentioning that simply because of well, the symbol that they use. And because used. you see them planting the flag on the moon, that's right. But it was the real deal 35 years ago today. Absolutely. Yes, it, it sure is. was. Hey, we got the real deal here today. There he is. Josh <laughs> is here with the weather. <laughs> I'm still thinking about the computer as big as a house. Uh, I'd never get my work done. Take a look right now. This is uh, the shot from Sky 9 over Acton. And uh, you can see them uh, cutting a line right now, those bulldozers actually pushing away, uh, covering up the flames with the dirt there, uh, trying to extinguish some of the flames and, and cut a line to uh, lessen the advance of those flames. So a lot of work being done on those lines uh, up in L.A. County. Let's uh, take a look right now at the grand totals for today. We got up to 88 degrees, 84. That's the average. So we were above that today. It looks like we're going to be above that again tomorrow. Then things change a little bit, and I'll flesh that out in the five-day forecast. That's coming up in a little bit. Back to you guys. All right, Josh. Okay. Everything old is new again for the L.A. Lakers. Tonight, the team's latest addition speaks out. Plus, is Michael Jackson about to father quadruplets? Details straight ahead. Weather on KCAL 9 News brought to you by Cadillac. Bold vehicles to find convention. Linda Ronstadt is performing in Universal City tonight after being booed off the stage in Las Vegas. Ronstadt was about to do her encore at the Aladdin Saturday night when she called controversial filmmaker Michael Moore, quote, a great American patriot and urged the audience to see his documentary Fahrenheit 9-11. Some people booed, others threw drinks in the air. Many simply walked out. The Aladdin management canceled the first, the rest of her performance and had security or escort her off the hotel property. The king of pop may soon be the father of quadruplets. There are reports that Michael Jackson will have four more children. According to the magazine Us Weekly, the kids will be carried and come into the world through a surrogate mother. Jackson already has three children. He and his ex-wife Debbie Rowe have a son and daughter. Jackson's third child was also born to a surrogate mother. Jackson is denying this new report. Well, after six seasons with the Sacramento Kings, Vladi Divac is back sporting the purple and gold once again with the Lakers. He has some big shoes to fill, Shaq's shoes, size 23. Divac will replace Shaquille O'Neal at center. While Vladi knows that he cannot put up the big fellow's numbers, he can give the Lakers some very high-quality minutes. Well, it, look, it looks, you know, when I was 21, I had to fill uh, Kareem's you know, shoes. Now it's uh, Shaquille. It's definitely tough, but like I said, this is a team, sp uh, team sport and we have to be all together on the same page and help each other. Somebody asked me, you know, how you choose, you know, Lakers. Uh, it was easy, you know, for me. This is my another home, you know, it's a familiar situation for me, for my family, so it was easy to get back. Vladi was originally drafted by the Lakers back in 1989. He played for the team for seven years before being traded away so that the Lakers could get the rights at the time to Kobe Bryant. Now they'll be playing together. Boy, yeah. And they're both happy about that, mm -hmm. I think. <laughs> a child is hospitalized tonight. Police say the chances of survival are small. Details are coming up. Plus, a candlelight vigil for a teenager missing in Joshua Tree National Park. We'll have the latest on the search. And after more than a year away, Ruby the Elephant is coming back to the L.A. Zoo. Plus, we'll have a live update on the Acton Fire. You're looking at a live picture right now. This is KCAL 9 News at 8. The issues, the party, the candidates. KCAL 9 News takes you to Boston for up-close team coverage of the Democratic National Convention. From the opening ceremonies to the party nomination, get live in-depth analysis from political correspondents Dave Bryan and Linda Breakstone. Go behind the scenes as Democrats unite for their final push to the White House. Election 2004 live from the Democratic National Convention in Boston starts Monday on KCAL 9 News. Teresa Heinz Carey. It's the wind blowing. Then why Martha Stewart left New York and Star Summer Diet. Next DT. Tonight at 11 on Kick Out Live.
David Jackson, Tad Harvey, and Byron Miranda with weather. You're watching KCAL 9 News at 8. Detectives are trying to sort out the details of a terrible attack. The victim, a 16-month-old boy. Dave Clark is live at Huntington Memorial Hospital with the latest. Dave? Pat and David, I am standing in front of Huntington Memorial Hospital right now. Details are very slim and basically none at this point. We do know this much, that homicide detectives from the L.A. County Sheriff were sent here to investigate this report, and we believe they're still here. We'll show you some videotape just as we walked around the hospital trying to get information. I did talk to a hospital spokeswoman by the name of Connie Matthews, who said that the family of the little boy has requested that they give out no information, and the hospital is saying nothing. What we have heard so far, according to the L.A. County Sheriff's, there is a 16-month-old boy described as an African-American young man uh, who sustained an assault. Some, it's been listed as an assault on a child. Uh, this call came in around 5 o'clock tonight. Uh, we're not sure how the young man was hurt or how badly he is hurt. Now, as we looked around the hospital, we can come back here live. Again, the information is very, very sketchy. Uh, we have not seen the homicide detectives. We've tried to reach them to get some information. We don't know a name of this child. We don't know what area he is from. All we have is the information, the confirmation from the L.A. County Sheriff's Department that a 16-month-old boy was brought here uh, sustaining some type, some type of assault injuries, but we don't know how serious it is, but it, we're given the impression that it is very serious. As we get more information, we'll try to pass it on to you. We're live tonight in Pasadena. Dave Clark, KCAL 9 News. Back to you. All right, Dave, thank you for that. A hiker who disappeared last week may have been the victim of foul play. The search continues for 17-year-old Eric Sears. He was last seen Thursday in Joshua Tree National Park. Tonight in San Diego, Sears' family and friends held a vigil, hoping for his safe return. As KCAL 9's Craig Figner reports, sheriff's investigators are keeping close-lipped close -lipped about the case. Sheriff's investigators have been added to the search for a missing hiker. If the disappearance of 17-year-old Eric Sears has been linked to a crime, the sheriff's department is insane. Sears was reported missing on Thursday. He and a friend, both from San Diego, went hiking in the massive Joshua Tree National Park. 100-foot-tall boulders dot the landscape, complicating any search. After five days with teams on the ground and in the air, still no solid clues. If Sears is still here, he's in endured several days of triple-digit heat, wearing a t-shirt and shorts, and maybe with just one liter of water. The teenager's hiking partner has said that the two became separated on Thursday, but that's it. The green pickup truck driven by Sears has been taken from the park. Investigators want to know if it holds clues that could change the focus of their search. Craig Figner, KCAL 9 News. We're going to take a look again at the fire that is uh, taking place live right now, still, of course, up over the Acton area, and Sky 9 is still up above, giving us a good look at the flames, considerable amount of flames still burning there on the ground. All right, and we're going to go to uh, L.A. County Fire Department spokesman Ed Osario, who can uh, fill us in on exactly maybe how much is burned and how firefighters are attacking this fire. We understand, uh, Ed, that right now they're just letting it burn? Uh, well, most definitely. We've got a uh, large fire front on the eastern flank of this fire that continues to burn in a northeasterly direction just south of the 14 freeway and the 138. Um, unfortunately, this is very rugged terrain, very inaccessible terrain for our firefighters. So the only thing we can do is basically let it burn at this point and try to protect the homes that are directly in its path. Um, air operations have ceased, which is the biggest uh, tool we have against these type of fires. And uh, it's just the safe thing for us to do right now. We can't put our pilots in danger. So I guess you have enough people on the ground, Ed, to make sure that you've got personnel around each and every structure or family home that might require that, right? Uh, most definitely. We have over 800 personnel uh, on this fire at this point with uh, more resources that have been ordered and they're uh, on their way. And uh, what we're trying to do is as soon as the resources are available off of the Foothill incident, they are traveling directly to this fire to assist us. Okay, so and from what we understand, um, how are you doing so far, Ed, in terms of uh, the structures that you are trying to save? Uh, do you have a pretty good shot of, uh, you know, making sure those buildings won't go up? 
Uh, well, most definitely. Right now, we've only had confirmed uh, one large wooden structure. We weren't sure if there was a, a home or a large barn, uh, one outbuilding and one mobile home that have been lost. Um, as of yet, we haven't had any other reports of any of the structures lost that have been confirmed. So we're doing fairly well. We're very lucky in the sense that we haven't had any injuries just yet, um, especially as night falls. Um, so it becomes a little bit more dangerous for our firefighters. But so far, we've been very, very lucky. And is there an official cause of this fire? No, sir. At this point, we are. it's under investigation. Our primary concern, obviously, is to protect the homes and lives of those people directly in its path. All right. Well, uh, Mr. Osario, thanks for joining us. We're glad, of course, that uh, uh, most of the structures are apparently uh, safe and that the firefighters uh, have not suffered any injuries out there because, uh, obviously, they've been out there for a long time, and this is a very difficult situation. And I'm glad to hear that they're getting some help. Yes. Now we're going to go back up to Sky 9 and uh, our Larry Welk, who is looking down on what is a considerable fire line there, isn't it, Larry? It sure is, and I can tell you they've done a phenomenal job of protecting these homes as we fly around this fire. And uh, the scope of this fire is just huge. Anybody that's familiar with this area will know uh, that this is very wide open, rugged terrain south of the 14 freeway, and it moved very quickly, quicker than uh, most of the fires we've seen uh, this fire season so far. Uh, but I can tell you, really uh, great job by these firefighters as they protect the homes, but it continues to burn to the east unchecked. This fire is still very much out of control. Reporting live overhead, I'm Larry Welk at Sky 9. Back to you. Right, Larry. Okay, Larry, and we're going to continue to keep a watch on that fire for you, obviously, and we'll go back as developments warrant. All right, moving ahead right here. Gray Heidel will remain free on bail, at least for now. A Santa Ana judge has delayed a hearing on whether to revoke bail until August 9th. Heidel, who is 19, is accused of having sex with a 16-year-old girl. He faces a misdemeanor charge of statutory rape. Heidel is also awaiting retrial in a gang rape case. His attorney today called him a kind, considerate, and polite teenager. Prosecutors say he's reckless and dangerous. David. Well, Pat, defense attorneys continue to hammer away at police witnesses at Scott Peterson's murder trial. Modesto police detective Ray Coyle was on the stand for a second day today. He testified that police questioned hundreds of registered sex offenders and parolees, but admitted that they did not follow up on a lot of their alibis. In a police report, one offender told police that he murdered somebody named Lisa Peterson and dumped the body in the Bay Area. He was eliminated as a suspect because of prior mental illness. Time now to see what's coming up on KKL 9 News at 9 o'clock. Kerry Kilbride is in the newsroom with a look. Kerry? Pat, thank you. Coming up tonight at the top of the hour, former Clinton National Security Advisor Sandy Berger is under an investigation on whether he removed secret terrorism documents from the National Archives. It has already cost him politically. We'll have more on the story coming up at 9. In Iraq today, a Filipino truck driver freed by insurgents after the Philippine government gave in to their demands to withdraw from Iraq. And tonight there was a new threat, this time targeting Japanese forces. And here at home, five days to go, and the tight security ring is going up around Boston, where thousands of Democrats will open their convention this coming weekend. All begins on KCAL 9 News at 9. We'll see you then. Pat and David, now back to you. All right, Kerry. Well, she left more than a year ago, and now she's coming back home. We are talking, of course, about Ruby the Elephant <laughs> returning to L.A., but the controversy over where she should be is far from over. And have a baked potato for dinner without worrying about the carbs. Still have the new low-carb potato or potato. Ruby the Elephant is coming home, back to her crib at the L.A. Zoo. <laughs> Seems she just didn't fit in with life in uh, Tennessee. No. Zoo life. But not everyone thinks returning is the best idea. KCAL 9's Jay Jackson has details. It sounded like a good idea two years ago. Move Ruby, one of the L.A. Zoo's most popular African elephants, to Tennessee, where the Knoxville Zoo specializes in helping African elephants. Zookeepers said Ruby would be happier, healthier, and make lots of friends. You don't see this in a while. It's an unusual this is the result of pacing, agitated Ruby that never made friends, never was happy. It's been bad from the start. And, and never should have left L.A., says Humane Society Vice President Gretchen Weiler. They call her dangerous and aggressive. 
After seeing this video, Mayor Jim Han ordered the L.A. Zoo to bring Ruby back. Today, the zoo commissioners made it official, but after hearing comments from Ruby fans. 19 hours of the day, she resides in a barn while experts debate her fate. How does that make her feel? Is she suffering? Does it matter? I say to you that it does matter. Was it a mistake to send her? No, I don't think it was a mistake. We had to try. I think it was important for elephants. It was important for Ruby to try to get her into an African elephant herd. Uh, it didn't work, so now we'll bring her back. But that's not good enough for some. Two powerful animal rights groups, In Defense of Animals and Last Chance for Animals, say Ruby would be in just as much danger here at the L.A. Zoo. Instead, they suggest she should be taken to a 2,400-acre elephant sanctuary just four hours from the zoo in Tennessee. What we'd like to see is all the elephants here go to the sanctuary, join Ruby in Tennessee at the sanctuary, and we would take care of the transportation. We would find ways to get Ruby there. We would pay for everything. She can bond with other elephants at the elephant sanctuary. It's just a better habitat for her. They walk on cement and concrete here, which is injurious to their joints and their feet, and it's just, it's not a good habitat for them. But zoo director John Lewis says it's not likely Ruby will go to an elephant sanctuary, mainly because she is still a healthy elephant. Meantime, he says there is no timetable set on when she will return to Los Angeles. At the L.A. Zoo, Jay Jackson, KCAL 9 News. All right, good. A call for help tonight to save California's brown pelicans. The endangered birds are dying at an alarming rate. Coming up, a look at what's being done to save them. And it is not just for wrinkles anymore. There is a new use for Botox, how it could help thousands of people. That is all ahead on KCAL 9 News at 8. The endangered brown pelican is in danger. The birds are dying off and shelters are overwhelmed trying to save them. KKL 9's Jennifer Sabi is live in Santa Monica to explain what's going on. Jennifer? Well, biolo biologists don't know what's going on, Pat and Dave. It's a mystery why so many brown pelicans are lying on the ground so emaciated and exhausted that humans are able to walk right up to them, pick them up, and bring them into rescue centers. With its ballooning beak and big ungainly body, the California brown pelican is a strangely beautiful creature. But what's baffling bird experts is the strange way starving pelicans are turning up by the hundreds up and down the Southern California coast. They all seem to have the same symptoms of being chronically emaciated, which means they're not getting enough food in, in the wild and they're often cold. The International Bird Rescue and Research Center in San Pedro is calling it a crisis. Since the first of the month, 36 of the big birds have come in debilitated, dehydrated, and close to death. SeaWorld in San Diego is caring for another 60, and there are 30 more up north of Santa Barbara. The numbers are, are huge. We're not used to getting this many birds at one time unless there's an oil spill. And scientists don't know for sure why it's happening. They speculate there may not be enough fish for the pelicans to eat this season. All they know is they're getting at least two calls a day from people saying they've found a dying pelican. Some apparently are crash landing in the street after mistaking the shimmer of pavement for water. Many of them are landing in or near roads. Sometimes roads can appear like waterways or channels to them. And so we've had some that are hit by cars. If rescued, the birds do well. First, there's somewhat of a feeding frenzy. Most of these pelicans haven't had a meal in days. After a couple of weeks, the big birds are ready to fly the coop. The rescue center sends them off with a full stomach on a wing and a prayer. They'll find some herring or some sardines on their own. The now endangered California brown pelican was almost extinct in the 1970s. Then it was DDT. Scientists don't know what it is now. But while they're researching, they're asking for the public's help. The rescue center has a lot of big mouths to feed, and any donations can help keep the California brown pelican in California's blue skies. Now, if you would like to help, the Rescue Center has set up a pelican adoption where if you pay for the price of the feeding and rehabilitation for two weeks, that's about $200, they'll send you a certificate, a picture of your bird, and give you updates on the pelican's progress. If you're interested, you can log on to our website, kcal9.com, and follow the links to pelican adoption. Reporting live from Santa Monica, I'm Jennifer Sabi, KCAL 9 News. All right, Jennifer. 
Well, those fires have really gotten ferocious out there. In fact, we've seen some vortices in some of those fires. We today. had that spinning fire that just like a, it's just like a tornado. That's right. Acts just like, like and it, what you're talking about is this this uprising of air, and it works just like a tornado where it, it turns. So uh, they these tra these uh, fires create their own systems Creating too. Its own climate. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and it looks like there's still a whole lot more work ahead uh, for firefighters. We aren't going to get any marine layer coming in anytime soon, especially when you're talking about that close to the high desert there. They really don't get any marine influence on a normal basis anyway. So let's take a look out the back door this evening and see what we are dealing with here. Uh, this is actually from a top of our building looking downtown at uh, downtown Los Angeles, and it uh, is a beautiful night. Clear skies over here in the basin, uh, clear skies throughout Southern California, but of course, the clear skies means dry, dry conditions for the folks who are fighting those fires up to the north uh, in Acton. At 85 degrees right now in Ontario, the dew point's up there at 64, uh, so that means it's a little bit humid out there. feels a little uncomfortable, 49% relative humidity, and the wind's out of the west right now at 14 miles an hour, so you can see things are a bit breezy out there, also a negative for firefighters. Ridge of high pressure, that's pulling up that monsoon of moisture. We've been in this pattern for quite a while. It doesn't look like we're going to break out of it anytime soon. Now, what happens is rotating clockwise around that high, we get an onshore flow. Well, what's going to happen is you're going to have a real difference in temperatures at the coast and temperatures inland. It's going to be cooler, actually, in the basin after tomorrow. Tomorrow looks like the same as today, but then things change dramatically. Uh, we'll have temperatures drop by 6 or 7 degrees. That's because it's Mother Nature's built-in air conditioning. So you have that onshore push right at the coast, clouds rolling into the basin, patchy fog right at the coastline, temperatures down into the low 70s. But you travel right past that marine layer, you've got rising air, and it's hot, downright hot inland temperatures into the 90s. Not much of a change. 95 in the valley tomorrow. Daily News has a detailed forecast for you. For the rest of us, the five-day forecast holds 80s. Lots of 80s for us. And as I said, tomorrow is probably going to be just a little bit warmer than today. 89 degrees, but cool at the coast. That patchy fog. Thursday, 82 degrees at the basin. Then Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, we're going to warm it right back up. And in fact, Sunday, we're back up into the 90s again, hot inland and the uh, monsoonal moisture. So it's kind of a little bit of a roller coaster ride in the basin, but inland, one thing and one thing only, hot. All right. Okay. Not necessarily good news, but thank you, Josh. You betcha. Yeah. Okay. Well, researchers say they've grown a low carb potato. We have the tail split up. And no sweat about it, the government <laughs> approves a new use for Botox. Has nothing to do with the potato, though. And he's broken his own records. Meet the man who's eaten thousands of Big Macs. That's all ahead on KCAL 9 News at 8. Weather on KCAL 9 News, brought to you by Kia Motors. Kia, make every mile count. Health Watch on KCAL 9 News, brought to you by Toyota. See your Toyota dealer today. Well, low-carb diets have been the rage, of course, but even some determined dieters find it hard to give up carbs altogether. This new spud may satisfy the urge to splurge. Researchers at the University of Florida spent years developing it with the help of a state potato grower and a Dutch seed company. It is nearly one-third lower in carbohydrates than a regular potato. No word yet on if it will be available at your local grocery store. Tests are still underway. Well, it can do more than just take away wrinkles. The FDA has now approved Botox to treat excessive sweating. Researchers say Botox can help people with a condition that causes them to produce four or five times the usual amount of underarm sweat. Dermatologists have already been offering Botox to certain patients, but FDA approval means manufacturers can now advertise its use. Side effects include headache, fever, and sweating in other parts of the body. Well, <laughs> the cost varies but can average about $750 for both arms. Well, now... That's plenty weird. <laughs> that really is right there. So you don't sweat on the arms, no. but you sweat on the face. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. He started 30 years ago, and really, he has never stopped. The man who's eaten his way into the Guinness Book of World Records. That's next today. And ahead on KCAL 9 News at 9 o'clock, he is 67 and retired, a full colonel, but he is not sitting around relaxing. He's now going to Iraq. Entertainment on KCAL 9 News brought to you by Acura. Experience the performance at your local Acura dealer. A Wisconsin man breaks his own Big Mac eating world record. Don Gorski made it into the Guinness Book of World Records last year for eating 19,000 Big Macs at the time, but that was nothing. Now he's been recognized for eating 20,000 Big Macs. He started eating the McDonald's burger with the special sauce more than 30 years ago. He had nine the first day, 300 by the end of the first month, 
He now eats two Big Macs every day. He still weighs in at 170 pounds. Gorski says that his Big Mac record proves the foods you love do not have to make you fat. It's a pretty good advertisement for McDonald's. We know you have many choices for news. We thank you for choosing KCAL 9 News at 8. There's much more to come. KCAL 9 News at 9 starts right now. Next on KCAL 9 News, former President Clinton's national security advisor in hot water and under investigation. At issue, did Sandy Berger illegally remove secret terrorism documents from the National Archives? The investigation has already cost him his job as advisor to John Kerry. The full story coming up. Also, insurgents released the Filipino truck driver they had been holding hostage after the last of the Philippines' troops left Iraq and they met the terror demands. And in Sacramento, the